بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله الذي العظيم الحمد لله رب العظمين صلى الله على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين لا سيما بقية الله في الأرضين أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف اللهم أخرجني من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمني بنور الفهم اللهم افتح علينا أبواب رحمتك وانشر علينا خزان أبنك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين الحمد لله we have to, to continue our studies on unit 4 we talked about Mu'jiza, Miracle and we said in this week, inshallah, we will go into the technical discussion about Mu'jiza. Uh, Muslim theologians say Mu'jiza is an extraordinary act. Something which is extraordinary. That a person who claims to be a prophet brings so it's very important it has to be a person who claims to be prophet and no one can bring like that and he also challenges people. Tahadi. So, a person who claims to be prophet does something extraordinary that no one can bring like that. And he says, if you don't believe in me, bring something like this. I withdraw my claim, but still no one can bring like that. This is Mu'jiza. So, if a person doesn't claim to be a prophet, it's not Mu'jiza. It can be Karama. For example, an Imam, a holy person, may do extraordinary things that people cannot do. We don't call it Mu'jiza, technically. Also, maybe a person has some special power, he does things that other people cannot do. It's not necessary for Allah to stop a person who does bring extraordinary thing. Allah doesn't need to stop him if he doesn't claim to be a prophet. But if he claims to be prophet and he has some extraordinary power, Allah has to stop him unless he's honest. Because most of people will be following this person when they see he has such power. If he claims I'm a prophet and he can do something that other people cannot do, people believe in him. So it's lutf, it's a divine grace to stop someone who is not honest and claims to be a prophet, to stop him from bringing something which other people cannot do. Okay? So if it is something not extraordinary, it is not mojiza. If there is something that you can go and learn, even if it is extraordinary, it's not mojiza. For example, some people have a spiritual energy, a spiritual power. They can do things that other people cannot do. Some people in India, they have had ascetic life, and they have exercised lots of practices. So they have some power that ordinary people don't have. I heard they may even look at the train and stop the train just by looking. They may only eat one date for many days just. They may sleep on nails. They may do they may walk on the river. These are extraordinary, but this is something that you can go and learn. There are people who train you for these things. 
But a prophet brings something extraordinary and says, no one can bring like this. If you go and ask the best masters, they cannot teach you this. This is of a higher level. Like Musa alayhi salam, what he brought, as we said, was something that magicians said, no way to compete. It's not something that, you know, if we exercise more, we also become like that. <laughs> you know, for example, if two people are uh, lifting weight in Olympics, for example, one does 100 kilograms, another does 110 kilograms. So this one who does 100 says, I can train myself. If I look after my diet, I also can weight 110. Or if it is 120, still. But if it's 100, the other one just looks at the weight and the weight you know, goes up. It says, how can I train myself? By looking, just the weight goes so it's not the same kind of sport. This is something else. When magicians looked at Moses of Musa, it was like someone looking at the weight and just flying. Like this. <laughs> so, they said, no way to compete Musa. When doctors looked at Isa, they said, it's not that Isa, for example, healed the ill people faster or more easily or with less medicine. No, he revived the dead. This is not medicine. Or someone who had no vision all his life, you know, this was closed, he was giving them vision. Or giving life to a statue of a bird. So, Moses is a kind of extraordinary action that no one can bring like that. Okay? It's not a matter of learning and practice. No one also can stop it. No one can stop. Because sometimes people who have power, they do something, but if someone has more power, can stop them. There was an uh, Arif in Mashhad, he passed away. He was a student, one of the students of Sheikh Hassan Ali Nukhudaki. I don't know if you have heard his name. So he was also experienced in Uluma Gharib, you know, strange sciences. And he was doing also uh, some hairs. So he used to go to India and he had a friend who was very much following him and he said that there is someone who can take the soul of people outside their body and bring back. So basically make them die and then bring them back. So he said, I want to see him. So he went to that person who was living in a very remote place in a kind of mountain. And that person, as soon as met them, made this person who had showed him the way die. To prove himself. So this person then didn't let him bring that person back. So no matter how much he tried to revive him, he could not revive him. He started sweating, he started you know, worrying, he cannot bring him back. Then this Adam told him, I let you bring him back, but you have to promise never do this with anyone. So when he gave him promise, he released him and then said to this person, this person is not a good person, you know, you shouldn't just go after anyone who has some power. This person wanted to show off himself. So you can be in that condition and still you have hope, still you want to be 
respected, you want to be excellent, you know, people say, oh, mashallah, he has such power. This is not a sign of piety and purity. If you remember, we had this discussion uh, that we said in Islamic spirituality, we are not after strengthening our soul. We are after purifying our soul. Yeah? We don't want to strengthen our soul so that we get some power. We read the hearts of people, minds of people, we do strength things. No, these are not important for us. We want to purify ourselves. So, mu'ajaza is something that no one can interfere and stop. If it's a magician, if it's a person, a person with ascetic power, you can stop him, but no one could stop prophets. It's irresistible. Also should come with claim and be compatible with the claim. This is also very important. Because maybe someone brings something extraordinary but against his claim. How? There was a person who claimed to be prophet. People told him, our well in village doesn't have that much water, a little water. Please do more for us, make this <coughs> full of water. So he uh, put water of his mouth in the well. It became 100% dry. It's mojiza. But we don't call this mojiza, although it's extraordinary. Why? Because it didn't come in the way that he wanted. Something extraordinary happened. No one can do that. But because Allah wanted to disclose his dishonesty to people. So, it has to be something extraordinary that no one can do, it's not through teaching, no one can stop, it comes with the claim, and it comes in compliance with his will. Not that he wants to do something and then something else happens. For example, you know, someone has fever, we say, you know, please give shifa to this, then he puts his hand and the person dies. It's mojiza, but... <laughs> This is Moses in the opposite way. Yeah, it's opposite. No one can do this. So literally, it's Moses. People are not able to bring like this, but we don't call this Moses. So, these are few technical conditions that have to be there so that we consider something as Moses. An extraordinary act that a person who, bring, who claims to be prophet brings. He does challenge, he claims that no one can bring like this. He is not in need of teaching, no one can stop him. And what he brings is according to his claim. Okay, Alhamdulillah, we finish this unit, we go to the next unit. Unit 5 is about a specific prophethood. And Nabuwatul Khassa. Unit 4 was an nubuwwatul amma, general prophethood. This is about the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, first, there is a brief study about character of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Two things were very important in the success of Islam as main factors. There were other factors, but two were very, very important. One was the Quran, the other was the character of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Two 
Today we have Quran, but we don't have the character of Prophet. This is why we are not succeeding. We have Quran, Alhamdulillah. If in the time of the Prophet, Quran was coming gradually, we have all Quran. With translation, with commentary, beautiful print. What we don't have today is character of Prophet. If Prophet was today alive with us, of course he's alive, but physically, I am sure in a matter of few months, majority of the people of the world would be falling in love with him. Just to see his akhlaq. His akhlaq was a great mojiza. In a society in which akhlaq was not not only important, akhlaq sometimes was a sign of weakness. To be kind was, for many people, weakness. You have to be harsh. You have to be strong. Strong is to be harsh. If you kiss your children, it's bad. I told you maybe that once a person so prophet kissed his grandchildren, he said, I never kissed my children. Can you imagine a man never kissed his children? Because this sign of weakness, a man should not kiss his children. Rasulullah said, Man la yarham, la yorham. If you don't show mercy, you will not be shown mercy. For them, harshness and strength were equal. They had very few exceptions of morality. Even that sometimes was not consistent. For example, they had some level of hospitality from Ibrahim alayhi salam. They had inherited a little bit of hospitality. But not all the time. So sometimes they were very bad to the you know, people who went to Mecca. To the pilgrims, to the people who went for trade. Sometimes they cheated them, they looted them. But if someone goes to their own home as a guest, maybe they were a little bit hospitable. But for most part, no akhlaq. In that society, Rasulullah said, my mission is This is 180% contrast. In a society in which akhlaq is not important, he doesn't say akhlaq is part of my mission. He doesn't say, I have come to improve akhlaq. He says, I have come to accomplish noble traits of character. So from zero, we want to go to hundreds. This is not human, this is divine. If it was human in that society, nothing could inspire you to aim at excellence. Makarum al as we said in the discussion about akhlaq, remember we said the difference between makarum al and mahasan al Do good to the people who have wronged you. Give to the people who denied you. This is makarum al There is a there is an Orientalist, William Moore. And here there is a quotation from his book about life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have this in our own sources, but it's interesting to see that even a non-Muslim, you know, mentions this. So he says, the Prophet was very kind, good-natured, humble. He was very humble. No trace of arrogance could be seen in the Prophet, even <coughs> when he became the Prophet, even when he had thousands of followers. No arrogance, no pride. He was humble. 
Even poor people were very comfortable with him. Even children were very comfortable with him. Old women, old men, everyone was comfortable with the Prophet. To the extent that some young people took advantage. They treated him like one of them. And sometimes they annoyed him, they hurt him. They used to sometimes go outside his home when he is in Medina, not even in Mecca. When he is now head of the society, he's a prophet, he's head of a society. They used to go outside his home and shout him, you know, Muhammad, and they speak to him from outside home. Or call him, come out. In Surah Hujurat, Allah said, They used to go to his home to visit him without permission. Can you imagine? Not only they didn't feel that they should not go to his home, they were very comfortable to go into his home, which is a little you know, room, and they were not thinking that they need permission. Then Rasulullah was not stopping them. Allah said, "La tadkhulu buyut an Nabi illa an yuzan alakum." He didn't say this. Do not enter the house of the Prophet unless you are given permission. And then when they went inside the house, they used to wait for food. And then after food, they used to wait for hadith, you know, now we have food, let's have a conversation. Quran says, when you go there, don't wait for food. And now. And also, So he was so patient, so kind, a kind of feeling embarrassed to say anything about his own comfort or convenience. People who were dishonest, you know, there were some munafiqeen, hypocrites in Medina. The Prophet was so kind that they were lying to him and he was aware but he was not rejecting them. Can you imagine? Then they used to say, this person doesn't understand. Whatever we say, he believes. They used to say his ear. In Surah Tawbah. Some of them, they say his ear. And Allah doesn't say he's not ear. He says, yes, his ear, but it's a good ear. So he was listening to people, not correcting them as much as possible, not rejecting them, not saying you are lying, not saying you are wrong, not saying, you know, make it quick. So he was walking, then an old lady comes and starts talking about, you know, maybe his animal, her animal, maybe family. You know. The Prophet just listened. This akhlaq of Prophet is great mu'jizah in that society. So sometimes I say in a society in which there was no rahmah, even for their own daughter, even for their own family, no rahmah. Rasulullah changed that society, the society that ruhamau bayinahum, they become full of rahmah, they were dying for each other. In a battle, someone, so there are some Muslim soldiers who are injured. And you know, when you are injured, you become thirsty. Yeah? When blood is coming, you become thirsty. So he went to offer water to the first one. He said, give to my brother. He went to the second, he said, give to my brother. By the time he reached the last one, he was dead. And then he went back, all of them died. So they preferred to die and give water to their brothers. 
This is the society that Rasulullah managed to make. He pumped so much Rahmah to that society that made people who were cruel into loving, caring, kind, compassionate people. This is Mojiza. So, he says he was very kind, humble, patient. We talked about difficulties of the messengers and you know those who were Ulul Azm. Prophet had very, very difficult life from childhood up to the last day. His life was full of difficulties, full of challenges, full of tests and trials. He was very generous. One of the things we find about the Prophet was he didn't like to say no to people. We find this about also some of real followers of Prophet, like Allah Metabatabai also, it is said he was like this, he was not saying no to people. So the Prophet was not saying no to people, and if people asked something that he could not say yes, he was keeping silent. And people should realize that he cannot do it or he's not, you know, happy. If someone invited the Prophet, as much as possible, he was accepting invitations. Even if the poorest person in Medina was inviting the Prophet, he was accepting. He was not rejecting any hedia, any gift, even if it's a small gift. He was not rejecting. When he was with people, few people, he was distributing his sight equally. So he was not looking only at one person. He was distributing his sight equally. And he was so much showing love to everyone that everyone was thinking he is the most loved one. He was so much careful not to show more attention or love to some people and not the others. If someone was happy, for example, someone just had a child or someone just had a, received a good news, the Prophet was showing joy and happiness and, you know, hugging them. If someone was sad, maybe lost someone, bad news, the Prophet was showing sympathy and, you know, was becoming sad for them. So he had this much of unity even in his emotions with people. He was very kind with children. You know, sometimes adults, especially when they become middle age or old age, keep distance from children. And they don't want to be seen with the children because then people don't take them seriously. And also when you are with children, you have to be ready to sometimes, you know, some behavior which may not be the best. But Rasulullah was not keeping distance from children. He was with children, he was kind with them. Maybe I told you, sometimes children were asking Prophet to play with them. Once some children stopped him and said, you play with your grandchildren, you have to play also with us. And the Prophet didn't say, no, I play with my grandchildren, you go to your grandparents. No. All children are his children. So, he started playing with them, but said to Bilal, please go home and bring something. So Bilal went and brought some walnuts. The Prophet said to these children, are you happy to take these and free me? They said, yes. 
And then Rasulullah said, they sold me cheaper than Yusuf. <laughs> <laughs> I hope we don't replace Rasulullah with anything from dunya. So, this was the character of Prophet. He used to share his food even if he didn't have enough. So, this is what this gentleman, this Mr. Moore says. Ayatollah Mutahari also has a beautiful discussion in the third volume of his series, Jahanbini Islami. The third volume is Wahya Nubuwat, about revelation and prophethood. He mentions, he has a very beautiful uh, section at the end of the volume about character of the prophet. For example, he says about trustworthiness of the Prophet. We said in Akhlaq that even before he became Prophet, he was recognized as Amin. Even 13 years after Islam, the people who used to reject him, to torture his followers, to kill some people like Yasser, Yak Sumayya and others, they still used to leave their valuable things with the Prophet as Amana. And when Rasulullah was going to Medina, he asked Amir al muminin to give these Amana back to them. So people of Mecca who didn't believe in him, but they didn't question his Amana. This is what we have to be. You are not a good Muslim if non-Muslims cannot trust you. Now we see, you know, even Muslims sometimes cannot trust us. <laughs> but I'm saying even non-Muslims should trust you if you are a good Muslim. He was lenient and at the same time strong. He was not a person who had no principles. He was not a, a person who was compromising about his values. But at the same time he was very soft and gentle. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ Because of receiving mercy from Allah, you have become very soft and gentle. So we can be strong and gentle. Amir al-Muhir says in Khutbah al-Muttaqeen, فَمِنْ أَلَامَةَ أَحَدِهِمْ أَنْ تَكُوْ مِنْ أَلَامَةَ أَحَدِهِمْ أَنَّكَ تَرَى لَهُ قُوَّةً فِي دِينَ وَحَزْمًا فِي لِينَ Among the signs of muttaqeen is that you see they have strengths in religion. In Iman they are strong, but they are far-sighted and they are gentle. If you have these three, you do wonders. A strength in Iman, but be far-sighted and gentle. Sometimes we are not strong. Sometimes we are strong, but we don't plan. We don't see the future. We don't prepare for future. Or we are not gentle. People don't come to us. Run away from us. Be gentle, but strong. Like water. Movement should be like water. I think I mentioned this at the last point. What is the characteristic of water? Water is flexible. You can put water in any container. It's triangle, it's, I don't know, circular, circle, whatever, you can put water. It goes to any container, but would not lose any part of it. But if there is 
metal or wood or a stone doesn't go to containers and if people want to put them in containers they break them so if you are not flexible they break you you have to be flexible and then if you are flexible you can keep everything if you are not flexible then they make you into pieces so water is flexible but maintains its identity plus depending on how you approach water water responds some people are always the same always harsh water is not like this if you go gently towards water water opens itself if you want to hit water hit you back you know if you dive to water and you don't know how to dive it can kill you it becomes like a stone so mu'min is shadid but shadid in the sense of not harsh is strong you want to hit him hit you back you want to be nice with him is very nice and gentle not always strong not always soft you give choice to people if needed we are strong if not we are showing you openness and softness and kindness a moment should be like this not that all the time you are a stone no you have to be approachable and nice okay inshallah we continue with the rest of unit 5 about some aspects of the character of the prophet and then we go to the quran and to the mujizah of the prophet and we will see how we can interact with the quran alhamdulillah rabbil alamin